I think we should wait for like three, four minutes more for more students to join and then we can begin. Yes, let's do that. Okay, I believe we can begin and I'm sure more people will join, but um, so let's start by thanking everyone for being here. Uh, so this is a continuation of our previous seminar on central bank digital currencies, uh, again presented by Lambis Dionysopoulos, who is a, a researcher in finance and also faculty member here at IFF. Uh, and like I said, this is a second, let's say a second part of the series. Uh, where Lambis will talk specifically on stable coins and stable coin growth. And uh, as a reminder, uh, this seminar hosts both, uh, both IFF faculty members as well as students. So it's a great chance for people to uh, communicate together, uh, bring up their ideas. Uh, and the goal of the seminar is uh, to have a discussion in the end. Uh, and so, yeah, I think uh, I think that's pretty much it. And uh, Lambis, uh, thank you very much for this. And uh, please uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrea. And uh, hello, everyone. And thank you very much for being here. Um, of course, most of you know me as either your uh, colleague or your teacher. But as I've said before, in my spare time, I am also a PhD uh, student in finance. Uh, today, as Andrea said, uh, I would like to present you our research on the determinants of stablecoin uh, growth. Uh, this was produced, of course, as part of my PhD thesis. And before I start with the presentation, I'd like to take a moment to talk about the motivation uh, behind this uh, research. So the cryptocurrency space has ebbed and flowed over the past 10, 15 years that it has been uh, around. And... I'm also setting up a timer to make sure that I don't go overboard. Um, but the only constant in those variations have been has been that stable coins, uh, since their introduction, have continued to grow no matter what. We can measure this by market capitalization. We can measure this by value traded or settled. Stable, stable coins are a huge part of the industry, and they continue to grow. Now, People in the cryptocurrency industry have thoughts about what drives this growth. Um, but this research demonstrates that many of those conventional wisdoms about stablecoins are wrong. So in this presentation, I will uh, first and foremost um, try to convince you that everything you think you know about stablecoin growth uh, is wrong or is not accurate. And then I will show you some empirical tests that hopefully demonstrate a, a novel factor that influences this vast uh, stablecoin development that we have, have been observing over the past couple of years. And we'll discuss the implications of this factor. So here is our agenda. I'll start with a simple definition for stablecoins as well as uh, some information on the role and classification. I will then provide you with an overview of the stablecoin space before discussing the conventional drivers drivers of growth versus the those novel drivers of growth that we examine, and of course uh, uh, discussing their implications for this the the industry uh, as a whole. Now, 
I understand that many of you are experts in blockchain and crypto, uh, but I'm also conscious of the fact that we are joined by the wider uh, uh, community of the university. So I'll try to make things hopefully as accessible as possible. So the first five, 10 minutes will be dedicated to introducing stable coins to everyone. And I'll start there. So again, final thing I need to mention, there's going to be time for Q&A. There's going to be time for discussion. So throughout the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A feature. Now, let's get started. What are stable coins? Well, they're, they're a very simple concept. Uh, they are a special type of cryptocurrency that aims to maintain a stable price against a price target with the most with that price target most commonly being the United States dollar. So for most in terms and purposes, for, for, for one unit of stable coin is almost always equal to one United States dollar. Now, this price target, the United States dollar, has nothing to do with the fact that stable coins cannot choose to track the price of some other asset. In fact, we have blockchain derivatives that do exactly that. And it has everything to do with the fact that stablecoins want to achieve stability and the United States dollar has uh, emerged as this universal measure of stability. It is the world's reserve currency. It is a base currency in trade. It is used as a store of value in many uh, instances. So this is why stablecoins elect the USD as a price target. Now, how did stablecoins emerge? This is a story that many people do not know, but stable coins started out as a regulatory compliant arm of exchanges. This is why many stable coins, they have closed ties with exchanges, by the way. So what do I mean by that? Well, back in the day, back in 2013, 14, even before that, people wanted to switch their fiat currencies, the euro and dollar for cryptocurrencies. But exchanges did not want to deal with the know your customer and anti-money laundering implications of doing this, of switching money from fiat to crypto. So what they did was outsource this function. The, they established an entity called the stablecoin provider could be responsible for just that. You'd go to the stablecoin provider, you'd give them a dollar, they'd run you through, through some KYC and AML checks, they would store this dollar in a safe bank account and they would create, they would mint an on-chain representation of this dollar, which we call a stable coin, which you would then be uh, free to use in an exchange to buy crypto or, uh, or to, to do whatever else you might want to do. So this is how stable coin emerged. They emerged as a, a regulatory compliant arm of exchanges. Now, because of that, because of their role as a fiat to crypto on-ramp, stablecoins became this sort of medium of exchange. Suddenly you could buy on an exchange any stable, any cryptocurrency you wanted with uh, stablecoins. So they became this medium of exchange. And because of their non-volatile nature, there is strong empirical evidence to suggest that stablecoins also served as volatility mitigation tools. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, when people, uh, when investors, when crypto holders expected prices to go down, they would switch their money to stable coins in preparation for the next you know, investment opportunity. Okay. Now, why stable coins instead of fiat? Well, because switching from crypto to fiat and then back to uh, crypto to capture the next opportunity incurs additional switching costs. You pay higher fees for that. Okay, so this is why stable coins were important as this medium term store of value volatility mitigation tool. So, up until now, we have two factors stable coins as medium of exchange, stable coins as volatility mitigation tools, and finally, um, stable coins also facilitated innovations such as decentralized finance. It is no secret that uh, the, the summer of DeFi was kick-started by the yields offered by Compound on, on, on stable coins. Okay? 
Um, so this is this is pretty much it in terms of how stablecoins emerge and what the utility of stablecoins uh, is. Uh, so what does the stablecoin landscape look like today? Well, as you can see on, on the left side of your screen, uh, where I have plotted the market capitalization of stablecoins until September 2023, they experienced tremendous growth. The market capitalization uh, skyrocketed from mere millions to over 160 billion in the middle of 2022. From that point, it has declined marginally, mainly due to the collapse of Luna Terra, which was a large stable coin. But if, if the plot continued, it, uh, continued until today, until uh, May of 2024, um, you would see that the, the market cap has... Uh, uh, retrieved its all-time high, its previous all-time high. Now, I'm plotting this now uh, next to the DeFi total value locked, which you can think of as a measure of assets under management by DeFi protocols. It is something we use to measure the size of DeFi. The reason I'm doing this is that when you plot them together, you sort of you can see the perseverance of stablecoins as a category, okay? So they started as this subset of DeFi, at least in terms of volume and value, and now they're larger than DeFi, okay? So again, this is to convince you about the perseverance and importance of stablecoins. Another thing you should know about stablecoins is that the space is extremely centralized. So it's dominated by a few large players, so this is a snapshot from September 2023, where four stable coins, USDT, USDC, BUSD, and DAI, were pretty much accounted for pretty much all stable coins that existed across Ethereum and, and Tron. The situation is even more dire today. BUSD was discontinued late last year, start of this year. Uh, so Today, USDT accounts for over 70% of the total stable coins issued. So collectively, Two stable coins account for more than 90 something, 93, 95% of total stable coins. Okay. So a very concentrated space. And it has been historically very concentrated. If we look at the dominance over time, of course, now that there is even higher, uh, 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 the stable coin space has been very extremely uh, uh, concentrated. Okay. Now, why is this important? Well, because USDT, Tether, the largest stable coin, uh, is pretty much the only successful example of, of a stable coin. Okay? So what goes for Tether goes for everyone, pretty much. This is to convince you about this fact. The final thing you need to know about stable coins, and with this we conclude the sort of introductory part of the presentation and we can move on to the juicy bits, has to do with, uh, uh, has to do with their classification. So generally speaking, we classify, if you look at the various papers that are out there, we classify stablecoins based on their management scheme into custodian and non-custodian. Uh, custodian or centralized stablecoins uh, rely on a trusted intermediary for operation. So you give this stablecoin provider a dollar, they store this dollar in a bank account, they mint this on-chain representation of this uh, dollar. So this is how custodian or centralized stablecoins work. We have non-custodian stablecoins, which are in theory decentralized and trustless. And instead of relying on an intermediary, rely on smart contracts and uh, decentralized autonomous organizations for this function. Stablecoins can also be backed by traditional collateral, so dollars, uh, uh, money market instruments, and the likes, they can be backed by crypto, there the are hybrid approaches to backing stablecoins, and there is also a special category of stablecoins called algorithmic stablecoins, which are essentially backed by equity. Uh, so I don't have the time to expand on this. So this is pretty much uh, everything you think you, you need to know about uh, stablecoins, okay? Now, here's the important bit. Given the information here, and given your knowledge, I have a pop quiz for you. So if you were to guess which factor has influenced the growth of stable coins the most, which one would you say it is? 
So by growth, I mean the the circulate the supply of stable coins because the more people demand stable coins, the higher the supply. Would it be the use of stable coins as this medium of exchange? Okay. Would it be the use of stable coins for volatility mitigation, meaning that when prices go down, supply of stable coins goes up to mitigate this volatility? Would it be speculation in DeFi? So would you choose number one, number two, number three? Which one do you think is the most uh, uh, like um, important factor in influencing stable coin growth? And by the way, while you take the time to think about this, please use the chat to... Uh, uh, type one, two, or three, those are the conventional wisdom factors, okay, that people think drive stablecoin growth, all right? Those three factors, as I've outlined. So most people say uh, number two, so volatility mitigation. Some people say number one, number three. So we have a, a healthy mix, but two and three seem to be uh, the more dominant. And this is exactly what I thought until we discovered that the actual factor that influences stablecoin growth is the issuer's profitability. Now, before I get into the specifics of it, uh, let's go back to the motivation of this stuff. So we started thinking about this last year at a time where crypto volumes were very low, so there was no need for stables as mediums of exchange where prices were going sideways, so there was, wasn't was really a need for huge volatility mitigation, and where DeFi volumes were at an all-time low, and there were no new investment opportunities, so no need for use in DeFi as speculation. And at the same time, stablecoins were uh, recording record profits, record growth in terms of supply, and new stablecoins were getting issued all the time. So we thought to ourselves, there must be something or else going on there. Those conventional theories of growth, the, 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 the medium of exchange, volatility mitigation, using DeFi for speculation, do not really add up. Now, the initial proposal of stable coins was that you give the issuer a dollar, they give you an on-chain representation of this dollar. However, Stablecoin providers have, in the last couple of years, transitioned away from this model. What they do now is they take your dollar, okay, and instead of putting it in a bank account, they invest it in, hopefully, but there is no oversight really, or no telling, in low-risk, low-return financial assets, to benefit from the yield, to benefit from the interest. So they mostly buy commercial paper and treasuries, right? So here are the reserves of the largest stablecoin, Tether, okay? And you will notice this exact trend. So you can see with red the commercial paper holdings and with blue the US Treasury bill holdings. When commercial paper rates were at the highest, so mid of 2021, Tether was the seventh largest commercial paper holder in the world. So, and as commercial paper rates started dropping off, Tether switched, sold their commercial paper and switched it to treasury bills at the same time where central banks started raising interest rates. Now, to us as researchers, this pointed to an active reserve management strategy active with the explicit purpose of maximizing profit. Now, you might say, what was the situation in the other stablecoins? Now, this is the only stablecoin that matters, but either in the, even in the, the rest of the stablecoins, we noticed similar trends. So this is USDC, this is DAI. Now, even a decentralized stablecoin stable managed to pass proposals to buy treasuries. Imagine that, okay? So what does this tell us? So here is how we represent the stablecoin issue as profitability. Profitability is P. So profitability is a function of supply. So supply and by extension reserves times the interest they earn on those reserves 
plus any redemption on the, or issuance fees. Okay? So the profitability of the issuer depends on how much interest they earn on reserves, which is uh, intuitive, I, I, I hope. Okay? And by taking some partial derivatives here, which I will not bore you with, we can prove that the stablecoin issuer's profitability is contingent on, on maximizing the interest they earn on the reserves and also maximizing the time for the, 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 the time you hold the stable coin for. So the higher the, the interest they earn on reserves and the longer you hold the stable coin for, the more money they make, okay? So they need to balance the dynamic of investing to maximize the profits. At the same time, not investing too risky to make you switch your stable coins for other assets because you're afraid that, you know, uh, 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 about their stability, okay? And you might be wondering, do stablecoin providers do this uh, consciously or is this just, you know, a theory? Well, this is Tether in court. Uh, if Tether's investment strategies became known to the public, Tether's investments returns may suffer and would be subject to risk of being front-run for certain asset classes. This would likely result in lower risk adjusted yields for Tether's reserves, which would in turn have an impact on Tether's profitability and competitive position. So here is Tether, Tether's lawyers, telling us that Tether's competitive position, its growth depends on the successful in investment, of, on the successful investing of its reserve assets, okay? But again, which is the factor that influences growth? Is it this or is, a, are, or is it the conventional theories of growth that we, we discussed about? So we collected, so the, before I get to that, so the first thing we did was calculate that is profitability. How do we calculate the profitability? Well, we got the weights of the reserves uh, for commercial paper and treasuries. Those are reported usually quarterly, so we linearly interpolated them to daily values. You can see this in the right with solid black color. We have the commercial paper weight as a percentage of total reserves. And with the dashed line, we have the treasury bill weight, again, as a percentage of total reserves. And then we got data on the interest paid on commercial papers and reserves. And we calculated the profitability as a function of the supply i.e. the reserves times the weight times the yield for commercial paper and treasuries. And you might be wondering now, what does this profitability look like? Well, it looks like this. They're not doing too bad, right? So despite the fluctuations in the crypto industry, Tether's profit has been going up. And not only has it been going up, it has been going up exponentially. Now, the second question you might have is, how accurate is this? given that it is an estimation based on some arbitrary assumptions we made. So we produced this back in uh, uh, December of 2023. Tether came out with some profit numbers in January of 2024. We were within 5 to 10% off from the real numbers. So it's pretty damn accurate. Okay. So here's what we did to prove whether growth is driven by profits or by actual utility of, or by actual utility offered by stable coins. We, we uh, collected a bunch of data to test those theories. So first, supplies for stable coins, then uh, DeFi total value locked to account for stable coins invested in decentralized finance protocols, then the price of Ethereum to account for this volatility mitigation aspect, Transaction numbers to account for, you know, the medium of exchange function of stable coins, some financial variables, the profit I just showed you, commercial paper uh, rates, treasury bill rates, depegging variables, so whether a stable coin depegs from its target price of one dollar or not. Why did we collect this? Well, because we thought that if a stable coin depegs often, upwards or downwards, this might have an impact on its growth. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. And finally, some seasonality variables and controls, okay? And we run the tests. Uh, just show you one test because we don't have enough time and because it's the most important one and discuss it in depth. 
So here's the, the test we run. And don't worry, it looks scary, but I'll break it down for you. And I also have some fancy highlights to, to help with, uh, with understanding what's, what we are doing here. So we have regressed the daily changes. You can see it here. This is our dependent variable of supply. So daily changes in growth, whether supply increases or decreases daily on all of those factors for the year 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2021 to 2023. Now, why do we choose this time period? Well, because this is when we start getting actual data on the reserves of Tether, so we can run tests and not uh, widely speculate. And the reason we broke this down in separate years, as well as covered the entire period, is that the reserve management strategy changes so often, it is like we are comparing a different entity. What did we find? Consistently across all periods, as well as for the entire period, the one factor that is the most statistically significant and has the most economic, economic uh, impact and meaning in determining the growth of Tether is profit. The profit variable we constructed in the way we showed you. So in 2021, when profit went up by $1, supply or growth increased by nine units. 2022, 2.68 units, 2023, 2.79 units, and for the entire period, 2.74 units. Now, which factors do not matter in growth? Well, we find no evidence for transactional demand Using DeFi as an investment vehicle or volatility mitigation actually influencing stablecoin growth. So when there is need for volatility mitigation, this does not really influence how much tether there is out there. Or as a matter of fact, USDC or DAI. Okay. The other thing we find, so the conventional theories of stablecoin growth are inaccurate. What is accurate is the profitability theory. What we find again is that deep pegging events do not seem to influence investors too much. Perhaps, you know, investors expect some minor deviations from the peg and they trust that the stable coins will retain their peg. So there is not a huge hurdle to the growth of the stable coins. And finally, we find some substitutability between stable coins. So this means that when the supply of Tether goes down, the supply of other stable coins goes up and vice versa. So there is some substitution effect. I will discuss what we, why we think this is the case. So this is pretty much the main finding, the, the, the new thing we're introducing. Stable coin growth is not contingent on those theories that people hold about stable coins. It is instead uh, contingent on the issuers making profit. And there is a lot of profit to be made out there. And this is why, regardless of market conditions, stable coins continue to grow, to grow and new stable coins continue to get issued. Because if you were a PayPal, of course, this is what you would do. There is uh, uh, you know, lots of money to be made. Now, what are the implications of our research? So as I said, we tested the three conventional theories of growth. Stablecoins as medium of exchange, stablecoin as volatility mitigation tools, stablecoin as an investment vehicle in DeFi, and the novel theory, the profitability of the issuer. We do not find consistent support for the conventional theories of growth. And instead, we find that stablecoin growth is consistently driven by higher issuer profits. Now, you might ask, how is this even possible like this? What is the connection between higher profits and, and higher uh, growth for stablecoins. Here's our theory, and this is just a theory, uh, which will need um, subsequent research to be verified. Uh, uh, our theory is that stablecoin providers are not expected to pay interest to their holders. So they make a bunch of money, they make a 5% return on the reserves, they're not expected to pay 
the, the stablecoin holder back. What they actually do, because they have close ties to exchanges, is set up those programs. Uh, I'm sure you've seen them if you're on Coinbase or Binance or what have you, that say, oh, you if you hold USDC, you can earn a 3.5% interest or a 4% interest. So what they do in essence is pay you back some of the profits they make to incentivize you to hold stable coins and to subsidize the growth of the stable coins. Now you might say, why, why are people stupid then? They're not investing in treasuries where they can make five and a half percent. Well, first of all, it is not as easy to access treasuries as it is to access you know, USDT or USDC on some unregulated offshore exchange. So there is that, you, you take, 3% return and a stable asset over your 70% inflation, inflationary national currency. And secondly, there is a convenience yield associated with, with holding stable coins for some users. They're able to transact in crypto and so on and so forth. So this is our theory as to the connection between the two. So what happens when CBDCs are introduced? We don't really know. So CBDCs are not that different from stable coins. They're centralized, but they're safer, okay? They're issued by a non-shady entity, okay? So the survival of custodian stable coins will depend on the ability of the issuers to provide some other convenience. So privacy, interest, and so on. Okay. And finally, some substitution dynamics between stable coins. Well, it could be the case because Tether charges a lot for redemptions that people who hold Tether okay, redeem their stable coins back to USD through other stable coins. So I hold Tether. I know Tether is going to charge me a lot to switch my money back to USD. So I buy BUSD or USDC, and then redeem that. And this calls into question if perhaps in the future, USDC or BUSD holders, I mean, BUSD does not exist anymore, but USDC holders will demand a premium for trading against uh, USDT. And whether Tether can actually fulfill those redemptions without the help of entities such as USDC and Circle. Okay. So this has been... Pretty much it. Uh, thank you very much. And I am ready to uh, have a look at the questions you have submitted for me. Um, so, Lati, could I ask you a question while yeah, you're course. looking at that, the ones? Uh, of course. In the chat. First of all, thank you very much. This was a very, very interesting and very uh, insightful presentation. Uh, I couldn't help noting that the the period that uh, increased profitability of stablecoin issuers has coincided with a period of increased interest rates for 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 the US dollar. And as you said uh, earlier, uh, profitability depends mostly on the on the on the interest rates. So would this theory predict that if we enter a period of low interest rates in the future and profitability of Tether, for example, uh, as you show now, inevitably goes down, the circulation of the currency will go down or just, you know, we're going to have a slowdown in the in the increase of, uh, of, of their issuance. Uh, I would be very curious to hear your answer on that. So that's a very good question. So what, what I think we show Okay, so we had data since 2017. The, the reason we did not include this data is because Tether did not report any reserves back then. So it is anyone's guess what they might have held. Okay, people say they held, uh, you know, majorly commercial paper over 80%. There's some leaks about that. People said they weren't bank, backing their stablecoin at, at all. They were doing fractional reserve uh, uh, banking with their stablecoin. So it's really very hard to tell what happened before 2021. Now, what we notice with the limited data we have is that it is not that profitability coincided with increasing interest rates, it is that profitability was tied to the ability of 
uh, uh, tether actively managing its reserve. So we went from a period where it held majority commercial papers because they were paying extremely high interests, okay, to a period where they, they were holding a majority of treasury bills, again, because interest in those treasuries started increasing. So, so long as there is no oversight over tether, okay, they can choose the reserves that uh, are the most profitable to them, that or at the very least, that balance, they think balance, profitability with uh, mitigating a bank run-like event. Okay, So in the future, if interest rates go down, there is no one stopping Tether potentially, un uh, unless you know we as Tether holders pressure them into doing that, from investing in things such as, you know, I don't know, stocks backing its 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 stablecoin with stocks or giving out loans in fact they had given out loans in the past including to entities if i'm not mistaken such as celsius at the 6.5 percent interest or six percent interest if i'm not mistaken so because there is no regulation because there is no oversight if i were tether and i had no pressure from the public what i would do if treasury bill rates started going down is just simply opt for the next low risk, low return investment opportunity. So I can continue making five, six percent on my on my uh, on the reserves people, you know, entrust me with. Right. So this is what I think it shows. It shows that if and when interest rates go down, tether might become more risky in an attempt to maintain its profit levels. And I don't think it is a good position to hold that People in the crypto industry will forgo profits if that means getting into higher risk investments. Okay, so the, 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 our industry does not have a good track record of that. So my expectation would be that they will become riskier. This is my prediction. But again, CBDCs enter the discussion here. Nobody knows what's going to happen. If I were a stablecoin provider today, I would position myself as a premier CBDC provider. There is money in that. There will be money in that. And it's a lower risk uh, uh, industry than, you know, just doing uh, uh, whatever Tether or USDC are doing at the moment. So this is my response to that. I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, absolutely, it does. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so let me see. I'll have a brief read uh, here. Uh, I'll start with the questions in the Q&A section. So CEO of Ripple said that US regulation is hunting, hurting USDT. Do you have some insights about it? I'll tell you this simple fact. Okay, It is clear from their metrics that USDC is losing the on-chain stablecoin race. USDT is absolutely dominant on chain. So here is what happened a few months ago. USDC pulled out from Tron, stopped issuing its stablecoin on Tron, and simultaneously uh, uh, encouraged the regulation, uh, regulators to look at Tron, the blockchain, and the potential illicit activity of stablecoins on Tron. So USDC has clearly lost the on-chain game. And what they're doing is use a regulatory leverage as an uh, you know as a as a US entity to pressure Tether. So yes, I do think that the regulators will be after uh, Tether. Whether it is for a good reason or not, I will not comment on. So uh, what are the implications of a failure of uh, USDT uh, in case, you know, the U.S. bans the coin? Well, there are two types of failure. There is failure in the U.S. market, okay? And there is failure as in what happened with uh, uh, U.S. Terra Luna, okay? If somehow, uh, you know, holding USDT becomes illegal for unhosted wallets in the U.S., I'm not sure the exact mechanism by this by which this could be achieved 
I think this will not hurt USDT too much. It is anecdotally utilized in um, developing nations. Uh, it is anecdotally again utilized in Eastern Europe. So I, as, as an American, you already have access, easy access to the dollar, you have easier access to the treasury. It doesn't matter too much whether you have access to, you know, a, a derivative, a non-chain non derivative of the US dollar on chain. And you also have other options, okay? You have USDC and other options. Now, if your question is, what would happen, what are the implications of a USDT's failure for redemptions, or a case where the USDT collapses, I think those would be massive simply because the USDT is everywhere. For many people, crypto is stable coins, okay? Uh, it backs loans. It is in, in, in a million protocols. Um, I think it even formed part of DAI's reserves at some point, which is insane. So I think that the, the implications of a potential USDT decoupling uh, will, will be massive. And I think it is it is a risk that the, the, the a cryptocurrency industry needs to start thinking about and decoupling from. Right. Um, OK. Um, is it true that Tether holds BTC as well? They do. Yes. Uh, I've, you can see it on, on your screen right now. If that is the case, uh, then our formula should be updated. OK, that's fair. We make the assumption uh, that in, in our uh, paper that Stablecoin um, Tether's reserves are exclusively in CP and Treasury bills, which is not that far off from the truth, um, because over 90% of them are actually in uh, Treasuries and have historically been in Treasuries or commercial papers. So even if we incorporate uh, Bitcoin in our model, then I don't think it will massively you know, change the key findings. Um, so, yeah, you you could in in theory have an expansion of this model that also includes uh, Bitcoin. You could have an expansion of this model that includes holdings they have in uh, corporate bonds, precious metals, uh, corporate loans. Uh, I mean, you could do that. I don't think it would change the main findings simply because uh, the vast majority of the reserves are in uh, treasury bills as of now, or over 80%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so let me see. The, 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 does the profit come in hand in hand with the demand? Well, we argue, we don't know the exact mechanism with which you know profit feeds into growth. Um, we can empirically observe it. We don't know the mechanism with which it is done. We propose that it might be due to this, you know, um, subsidization through offering interest to users through uh, their centralized exchanges that they have ties with. Um, this is this is what we think. This is the only idea we could come up with. Uh, there might be other. Um, Factors. Okay, moving on with the questions, we have just a few questions left. Um, therefore, it it seems that investors are used by stablecoins are used by investors as financial product. Uh, yes, they are. The, 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 that's a very good description of uh, what we are arguing. Why wouldn't investors prefer? Uh, um, money market funds or fixed income funds. Again, this is something we we, we argue. Uh, if you're in the US, if you are in the EU, if you are in, in, in um, a market that has high financial penetration, if you are uh, privileged and, and banked, then you have, I mean, stable coins do not mean much to you. You can access uh, pretty much every financial product you might want through your broker, and so on and so forth. But what happens if you are in Iran? What happens if you are in uh, uh, sanctioned Russia? Okay, uh, I would encourage you to do the following right now. Go on Google Trends, uh, on the Google Trends search platform and look up the keyword USDT. Okay, so Tether, USDT. 
set the geolocation to Russia and set the, the, the date range from start of 2021 to today. And you will notice that there is a huge spike, not after the invasion, but after the sanctioning of the Russian central bank. So this means that stable coins are used by people who do not have access to all those things you're describing. Money market funds, treasuries, US deposits, a, 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 a savings account that will pay three or five percent interest as you can get access to in, in, in the UK and Germany. Okay. Um, let me, we have two more questions. I'm not really sure about the question on the uh, first loss uh, tranche. If you could rephrase that, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, is it is it safe to say, uh, Levi, th that people are grabbing more tether stable coins before of those three reasons started? Daily, I'm trying to grasp why more and more people are increasing uh, their stable coin holdings. Well, look, I mean, I think that stable coins are an amazing tool to get access to uh, dollars to get access to some uh, low yields, okay? If you're in a country that suffers high inflation, uh, if you're in, in an area of the world that suffers from financial sanctions, it is, it is, it is a godsend, okay? If you have to choose between a, 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 a currency that is deflationary, highly defla high, highly inflationary, sorry, 70, you experience 70% inflation, if this currency is sanctioned, uh, if you have access to poor financial services, then having access to the dollar, even a, a derivative of the dollar, and this access, I mean, even having access to the 3% interest on this dollar, it saves you like, I don't know, 70, 80%, okay? It is an 80, 70, 80% interest uh, return to you. Uh, now, why has this become more of an uh, uh, more of a occurrence as of late? Well, it is easier to access crypto today and stable coins today than it was, I don't know, uh, five years ago or seven years ago or 10 years ago. 10 years ago, stable coins just barely existed, right? So as time goes on, it is much easier to set up a, a, an account with Binance or you know some 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 broker on your uh, phone and just dump some money uh, uh, into a tether. Okay, and at the very least, you have this uh, store of value. Okay, and you're also indirectly subsidized by the exchange. Okay, I would argue that most people buy USDT on Binance or on some uh, overseas exchange rather than on-chain, simply because, partially because it is more complex to do on-chain and you cannot, many people cannot afford to pay on-chain fees for that. Uh, I have another question here. Um, That's a very good uh, question. Uh, potentially, yes. So th th they're asking if you retain your earnings and don't distribute, you over collateralize. And we know that you know USDT is partially over collateralized, and this can serve as um, a cushion in in case there is a, a crisis. So they argue, a viewer argues, that the longer people hold stable coins for, or the more stable coin that is out there, you could increase this cushion, if I'm understanding the, the, the question correctly, and this could make the stable coin less risky. Well, in theory, yes, but do you actually know for a fact that Tether has this uh, buffer? Uh, do you actually know for a fact that they will, instead of, I don't know, doing what people do with profits, actually put them towards the stability of a stable coin? And even if they did, isn't the purpose of crypto that we are not supposed to trust 
entities about things that we should be able to verify on chain. I think that even 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 if Tether is the the most honest actor that exists in the universe, it is still a huge liability for the cryptocurrency space, simply on the principles of decentralization. Right? We should have come up, and I think we partially might have, with a better solution to Tether that does not rely on trust. Okay, that does not touch conventional systems, uh, that does not rely on 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 uh, fiat currencies okay uh, so this is this is sort of my response to that i'll check the the chat now for any questions um so uh, um how can central banks explore and actually lean into stable coins well if i were a central bank uh i would look at custodian stable points as a major uh, uh, opportunity for disruption. Uh, I think that, I mean, uh, CBDCs are stable coins, but better, custodian stable coins, by, but better that is, okay? So this is, this is my response to that. Um, Yeah, the, the, Horatio said, Tether is already risky. Tether becomes the seventh largest Bitcoin holder. Exactly that. So Professor Yaglis asked, what is going to happen when, you know, inevitably treasury bills are going to, to go down? Well, <laughs> Tether will become extremely risky. This is why it's a liability uh, to, the, to the entire sector. It has nothing to do with whether they're honest or not, or whether they're fully backing the, the reserves or not. They might as well be. It doesn't matter if they have buffers or not. It doesn't matter if they're, they're God incarnate. They are a liability because of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, because of these reasons. In my opinion, right? Okay, so I see Andreas raising his hand. Have we gone over time? Not yet. <laughs> well, I have a question myself, uh, and this yes. was this was an excellent presentation. Thank you, um, you very much, Lambis. And so, to me, it's very interesting that we see that a custodial stablecoin pretty much. Uh, well, you you make the point that 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 growth has to do a lot with profitability. And we see the the, the, the stable coin, which you know shows the more the most growth is is a custodial one, and yeah. since you touched a lot on the aspect of yeah, as as a decentralized environment in Web three, and all we we would pretty much prefer to avoid that. So yeah. what's the I I don't know what's the what's the story here? To me, that's very interesting because people will go after the profits in the end. So. And that got me thinking, and I would I would like to hear your opinion on this. So, just to expand on this for a moment, even Dai has transitioned to backing its stablecoin by reserves. In in so the, the real world asset category you see here, which goes unfortunately up to June two thousand twenty three, but I'm sure someone will have the updated numbers. 31% backed by pretty much what was majorly treasuries, and it might be even higher now. I haven't checked the, the most up-to-date numbers. So even the poster child for a decentralized stablecoin is backed by centralized assets, by you know assets held in custody in banks and financial institutions. Well, what I think uh, uh, this, this discussion points to, the, the, taking sort of a step back, is that well, it turns out that, that the peer-to-peer -peer cash use case that Bitcoin described is pretty much still very relevant. And we have unfortunately uh, moved away from this across the board in, in crypto, I would argue, right? We see this discussion about digital cash. We see this discussion about digital artifacts. Those are great use cases. Those are amazing use cases. But there is a very real need for actual peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash that is not that has not that is free of the pathogenies of the traditional financial system. Now, what I think banks have done is recognize this and will attempt, and in my evaluation, will succeed to 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 sort of half satisfy this need through CBDCs. It is an absolute total failure of the blockchain space that we, uh, that we did not foresee it and we did not manage to build systems that fill this need, that satisfy this need, that don't rely 
on trusting whether Tether or not tells the truth about the reserves. It is insanity. Um, so this is this is sort of my eagle's eye overview of um, you know uh, uh, the space. It is it is a frankly an embarrassment that we haven't accounted for this. Um, yeah. So just I guess figure out a way to build a decentralized uh, stablecoin is what I'm getting to that people will use and that will not rely on. Centralized custodians will not rely on on traditional assets. I know it's it's very hard, uh, but I mean this is this is what we should be looking into. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and what, what you're saying is very interesting because it's even more difficult maybe now uh, because of course, of course we have you know we have researchers, we have the technology, but we also have the past failures or of example Terra and Luna and, and the algorithmic side, yeah. which yeah. would be. For in my opinion, a logical, you know, a logical direction yeah. to go towards a, a, an algorithmic one, in order yeah. to avoid. And, the and, and I mean, even like um, more contemporary deployments, such as USDE, the Athena stablecoin. I mean, they they mint their stable coins on a delta spread between liquid stake teeth and a short position. I mean, I cannot even begin to list the billions of 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 risk factors that this uh, okay includes, and the, the, the real reason behind this is that they they want to pay high high yields to holders, right? This is not the way forward. I think, in my uh, humble evaluation, it is likely that it's going to end end badly for everyone involved, and we should instead go back to the use case of how do we provide secure, decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer money for people, which is, this is an extremely real use case. That is not to say that doing NFTs or DeFi or Degen plays or, or real world asset tokenization is not welcome or important. It, it absolutely is, but there is another use case that we must uh, uh, study. Okay. People making money is good, right? I'm, I'm not here to claim the opposite, but again, we should think about, you know, servicing people who are in need of actual useful money. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much, Andreas, and thank you very there much, everyone. some comments uh, on the chat. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Yep. So, yeah, take it away. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lambert. Yeah, so that was it. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know if anyone has any other questions or we can wrap up. No, that was it. Thank you very much for joining us and be on the lookout for more uh, IFF uh, seminars. Uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you for participating. And uh, I hope you enjoy. I mean, Andreas is going to put the link to the, the paper in, in the chat, I hope. Um, oh, but course. you can also email me here and I'll be more than happy to, to oh, sorry, to share it with you. Let me just put my email in the uh, chat here. Thank you, Christos. Thank you, everyone. You have a good day.